Welcome to today's life chapter reading of The Dog Thief and Other Stories by Jill Kearney. The Dog Thief. How it all started. Lucky, the three-legged pit bull, escaped from confinement in the tool shed by chewing his way through the rotten boards of the wall. He emerged, blinking in the sunlight, just as Donald opened his front door to toss some trash out into the yard. Donald gave a yell and charged down the steps. Lucky galloped across the yard and took off down the narrow dirt track that led through the woods to the paved road at the bottom of the hill. Lucky ran like a dog having a fit. With only one front leg, he tended to throw to the left and stayed upright only because of his momentum. At the bottom of a hill, a Berlin wall of moldy, eight-by-four plywood sheets hid a collection of ramshackle homemade dwellings. Cats drifted between the cabins, cruising for mice or tidbits of garbage. An old pickup quietly disintegrated in the mud in front of the main dwelling. Only the community totem, a soggy MIA flag drooping on a pole, could be seen from the dirt road. Three people stood by the open gate in the plywood wall and watched Lucky's clumsy three-legged race down the hill. They said nothing as the dog arrived, panting and exhausted, to collapse at their feet. They knew who the dog belonged to so they waited expectantly, watching the road. A few moments later, a fat, pale man in overalls arrived at a trot and halted, sweaty and breathless, at the property line. That's my sister's dog, he gasped. He had a large, shapeless head from which ears sprouted like pink mushrooms. His loose, wet mouth betrayed weakness, but his tiny eyes had the strength of a pig-headed stupidity. He took up a stance like a gunslinger and attempted belligerence. Give him here. No, said Black Snake. Fuck off. Black Snake was wearing combat clothes. Judging by the smell, it was the same uniform he'd brought back from Vietnam. He had a sizable pot belly, a gray ponytail, and a cynical gaze. His two friends, a scrappy one eyed woman and a tank shaped Native American, always wore hodpodges of military garb. All three were old but looked like they might have been pretty tough back in the day. The fat man had never been tough. He blinked, sputtered, and started a rant, waving one pink finger in the air. My mother gave that dog to my sister. He was stolen by those dope dealers. There's a gang of dope dealers hanging around my house. Your sister is dead, Black Snake rarely made eye contact, but now he directed a glare at the fat man. I said, fuck off, Donnie. Stand off. The dog sprawled in the dirt, worried brown eyes tracking the conversation. The three people didn't move, and their bodies melted into a wall as dirty and mean-looking as their plywood barricade. Muttering threats, the fat man backed away. The three watched silently, not bothering to jeer, as he turned and shuffled up the track toward his home. And that's how Lucky, the three-legged pit bull, was rescued by Black Snake and his crew. It was an impulse born of a marriage between spite and kindness. No one realized at the time that this simple act would set off a cascade of events, including a series of miracles and a felony. Blacksnake, Donald, and Elizabeth Blacksnake and Donald were neighbors. They'd live in a state of low-grade warfare for decades, mostly skirmishing about drugs. Blacksnake sold them, or maintenance of their shared road, Blackstick maintained, Donald didn't, or about witchcraft. Donald's mother was a witch, and it had been a source of deep offense to her that Blacksnake never succumbed to any of her spells. Donald's mother was such a memorably malignant woman that even after her death, her neighbors spoke of her in whispers. She was called her up the road, or just her, as if the invocation of her name might conjure up her malicious spirit. Forty years as neighbors, and Black Snake could count on the fingers of one hand the number of times he'd walk up the track to her house, and those were occasions when he stood in her yard shouting while she made faces out the window and threw curses at him. Much of Black Snake's acquaintance with Donald, his sister, and their mother was based on their treks by his compound to get to the bus stop down where the track met the paved road. Blacksnake had decades of snapshots in his memory of the three of them passing by. 
the old witch gripping frightened toddlers by their shoulders, her shoving skinny children along, her marching besides teens fat and soft from years of watching TV inside their tiny cottage. They used to hustle by pretty quickly, the children with their faces averted, while the old witch muttered dark invectives. After her death, Donald got in the habit of stopping by to chat sometimes on his way to or fro, not to be friendly, but just to hear the sound of a human voice. He still saw Black Snake as the man who, by staying alive, made his mother look less powerful than Donald believed her to be. He hated Black Snake for that. The sister, on the other hand, used to drop by sometimes on her way to town to ask if Black Snake or his crew needed something picked up at the store. She never dated, never married, and never had children, but she was good to her dogs. It's hard work being normal when your family's crazy, said Samish Bob, referring to Donald's sister. Bob, Black Snake, and the one-eyed woman were gathered in front of Snake's cabin for a final evening passing of the pipe. They had been smoking weed off and on all day, and were in that state of altered perception where nothing is surprising and everything is interesting. Elizabeth, their neighbor, had showed up unexpectedly with her own agenda. She was on a mission to investigate the Donald slash dog situation. She wasn't that normal, said Black Snake about the sister. Fucking little bitch. This last remark was addressed to his cat, a winsome tabby, full of purrs, who wound her body in future and figure eights at his feet. Black Snake hunkered down to tap her gently on her nose with one big stubby finger. Bob and the one-eyed woman watched this interaction with amusement. Tactfully, Bob held the pipe cupped in his hand out of Elizabeth's sight. So how long ago did the sister die, Elizabeth asked. Elizabeth was, in Black Snake's opinion, a pain in the ass. She had found the compound by accident, turned up the wrong dirt road, stopped to ask directions, immediately got nosy. She had followed up on that one mistaken visit with deliberate ones. Missionary services to the natives, in Black Snake's view. She didn't like the way he cared for his cats. Always bringing him bags of spendy cat food and handing him flyers about low-cost spay and neuter. She was the new owner of the Bear Lake Resort, come from somewhere far away. A big city, probably. It was her self-assurance that got up Snake's nose. He couldn't think of any reason why a stuck-up urbanite with hoity-toity ideas about pet maintenance would buy a rundown resort in the woods unless she was hiding from something. She was the right age to be a former member of the Weather Underground. He could envision her blowing up buildings for some political clause. Animal rights, maybe. There she was asking about the dogs up the road as if it was any of her business. Asking when the sister died. Shoot, how long ago was it? Bob furrowed his brow. Everyone thought. Black Snake guessed a year. The one-eyed woman put it more like nine months. It was Bob who let the dogs out after the sister's death. Upon hearing of her demise, he'd wandered up to her place to forage. He heard barking from her cabin and discovered five dogs shut inside. The door was locked, so Bob hunted around in the yard until he found an axe. The dogs had barked hysterically as he whacked the door. He chopped the knob off, opened the door, and the five dogs ran out. The inside of the cabin had been an appalling mess. Carpet bond was shit. No food or water. Bob wasn't into pets, but he knew that locking a bunch of dogs up in an abandoned house was a lousy thing to do. He went next door to talk to Donald about the dogs, but the conversation degenerated, as conversations with Donald usually did, into a surreal flow of confabulations and drama spun from the endless tawdry TV shows that fed Donald's mind. <clears throat> so, are the dogs still there? Elizabeth asked. Everyone shifted around and shrugged. They were cat people down at the compound and hadn't thought to go up the road to help the dogs. It had been a major deviation from the norm when Black Snake rescued Lucky, the three-legged pit bull. Lucky was a genial animal and very grateful to Black Snake on the crew. On the day of his rescue, Lucky had been encrusted with dried feces, with pea burns on his butt, and bloody rasserations on his nose. It had taken most of the water in one of Black Snake's rain barrels to clean him off. 
The people at the compound cared about Lucky, but they didn't want to keep him because he chased the cats. There was no chance that he would ever actually catch one. He couldn't take corners fast without falling over, and his efforts were hilarious. But Black Snake didn't want his cats bothered. And now, through a strange process of small-town osmosis, the news about Lucky and the sisters' dogs had come to the ears of Elizabeth, hence her visit. <coughs> well, I guess I'll go up the road and check things out, Elizabeth said. She started walking up the hill, swinging her arms with determination, while Black Snake and his crew watched. Now she can ride Donald's ass for a while, said Snake. Bob laughed. The Subaquit Peninsula was about 20 miles long, 10 miles wide, and encompassed two separate realities. The edges were dotted with expensive ocean view homes, culminating in an upscale golf course community at the tip. A seven-foot-tall chain-link fence with an elaborate wrought iron gate divided the golfing community from the rest of the peninsula. Whether the gate was to keep the barbarians out or in was a matter of perspective. Most of the interior was corporate-owned timberland. Up the innumerable dirt tracks leading into the woods were the homes of the descendants of the original settlers and isolated enclaves of old hippies who bought acreages back before the road was paved and the land prices skyrocketed. The old-timers and old hippies were a beleaguered lot living behind walls, fences, and keep-out signs. Some cobbled together ex existences based on meth labs or puppy mills. The more respectable ones did odd jobs off the books for the peninsula's wealthier residents to supplement food stamps and disability checks. They burned wood, gathered water and rain bales, and pooped in the woods like bears. Sometimes, when they died, it was weeks before anyone noticed. <coughs> Donald lived in a disintegrating cottage nearly buried in overgrown shrubbery half a mile back in the woods. The clearing around the cottage was strewn with large hunks of rusting metal, old appliances, old cars, oil barrels, and everything overflowed with sodden trash and rainwater. Dilapidated outbuildings along the edges of the clearing were disappearing beneath blackberry vines. A musty stink rose from the damp ground. Elizabeth surveyed the mess and wrinkled her nose. Just because someone was poor was no reason to live like a pig. Well, that thought was unfair to pigs. She looked for dogs, but saw none. However, the lot was so crowded with tangles of blackberries and collapsing outbuildings that a pack of dogs could be hidden if they didn't bark. Elizabeth found a footpath through the grass and debris and followed it to the front door. She knocked. A series of thumps indicated footsteps approaching. The door opened a cautious crack. She saw a pale, red-rimmed eye surrounded by dusty, inflamed skin. Good evening, Donald. How are you today? Elizabeth greeted him with a big, fake smile. Slowly, a round, bald head emerged from the cottage, followed by a bulbous body. Donald blinked in the sunlight, as uncomfortable as a snail dragged out of its shell. Elizabeth ignored his squints and grimaces. My name is Elizabeth, and I'm a friend of your neighbor's, she chirped brightly. They say you have some dogs you need help with. Donald made no eye contact. He just mumbled, I don't need no help. They told me that your sister passed away and left some dogs. I know of a dog rescue that could help find homes for her dogs. I'm taking care of them. Could I see the dogs? I love dogs, and I heard that your dogs are really special. Donald stepped out of his house. He was wearing a bathrobe and boxer shorts, and Elizabeth could see far too much of his pink flesh. I take good care of the dogs, he told her. I'm sure you do, but I can help you. I can get dog food for you, dog beds, that sort of thing. I can get them spayed and neutered for you so you don't have to take care of puppies. My sister did that. All of her dogs were fixed. Why don't you show me? Then I will know that everything is all right. Silent and grumpy, he guided her across the minefield of junk to a pair of ramshackle kennels butted up against a wall of salal and huckleberries. Behind the wires, two weary dogs climbed to their feet, wagging their tails feebly, wishing for food but not hopeful. The kennels were constructed of odds and ends of chicken wire and scrap wood enclosing mud and feces. Donald hadn't thought to put in gates because it hadn't occurred to him that he might ever want to clean the kennels. Elizabeth was horrified, but she praised the kennels effusively. 
Donald glowed pinkly in her approval. It's the Hilton, he bragged. He was waking up, beginning to get talkative. Talkative. Those dogs live better than I do. That wasn't saying much, since the cottage stank like a waste disposal site. The dogs were friendly, poking their noses against the wire, thrusting anxiously, needing needy faces towards Elizabeth. There was no food or water in the kennels. Donald watched at a distance. You need wa buckets for food and water, Elizabeth told him. I give them water every day, fresh water. They knock the bowls over. Let's find some buckets, Elizabeth said cheerfully. They hunted around until they found some rusty paint cans. Elizabeth made Donald hose the dirt out before filling the cans with fresh water. Do you want to keep these dogs? Elizabeth asked. I can find good homes for them. They were my mother's dogs. Donald leaned forward, hands clasped in front of his chest in an almost prayerful attitude, blinking piously. I am keeping them for mother. My mother always took good care of her dogs. He nodded solemnly. They are purebred Alaska Huskies.